Hi there. Welcome back to my channel. It's Emma. If you clicked on this video, maybe it's because somewhere in your life you read a few words of the poet Rilke and you thought, wow, what now? Where can I get more of this? Or if you are subscribed to my channel, maybe you've just heard me talk about his work way too much and here we are. This whole entire video is going to be dedicated to Rilke, to his poetry, his prose, his creations, and it is going to be mostly centered on where to start reading him, where to start looking for books, collections of poetry, and where mostly if you're someone looking to get into Rilke for the first time in your life, where you should begin. The first thing I want to say is that I by no means am an expert. This is solely my own personal opinion as someone who has loved Rilke for almost a decade now and has read a lot of his work, by no means all of it, because I am trying to save up a lot of it because I never want to run out of his words. I always want some words left to meet for the first time, but this is solely my personal opinion. If I was thinking of myself as someone beginning with Rilke, where would I want to start knowing what I have read in the way that I have read it. For me, the way that, at least for the purposes of this video, I've arranged Rilke's work would be the best way I would want to experience it in this order. I've put off filming this video for such a long time. You guys have been asking for months and months, but I'm actually currently in the middle of reading one of his works, a collection of his letters, and I just got so inspired and I was like, why am I still putting this off? I think because most of the time, at least for me, it's extremely difficult to vocalize why I love the things that I love so much, the things that I love the most in my life. And if you've been on this channel for any length of time, you know Rilke is my favorite poet, one of my favorite people who has ever laid pen to paper. I don't think that's ever going to change. In the whole of my life, I have never discovered another person who writes like he does and who has affected me like he does. So it was extremely difficult and kind of almost a feeling like I didn't want to talk about him at all, not only because I was so scared that I could never do it justice or talk about him in a way that I would be pleased with, but in the end I've just always gotten so many positive wonderful messages from people who have read Rilke, who have read anything by him, and they've just been so affected, and I know exactly how that feels, so I just thought um, I would make this video regardless of how it turns out. Briefly, before we get to the works and telling you where you should start with Rilke, I thought I would give you a very brief synopsis of his life, and mostly just through the lens of his artistic career, what he did, and some of the people he met, and stuff that really, really affected him. This is by no means a lengthy exploration of his life because he had an immensely interesting life that will not even basically be touched on in this video. If you want to skip this little introduction as well as my experience reading him, you can skip to this timestamp right here to get right into the recommendations, but if you would like to hear a little bit about him, let's start. All right, so who is Reiner Maria Rilke? Who is he? He's been called one of the most lyrically intense German language poets of our time. A very lovely description of him that I think is just perfect is found in this edition of the Book of Images, but it calls him the poet of memory, of childhood, of leave-taking and looking back, the poet of night and its vastnesses, the poet of human separations, the poet of thresholds and silences, of landscapes charged with remoteness and expectancy, the poet especially of solitude in all its endless inflections. Rilke was born in Prague in 1875, which at that time was still part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He was the only child. His father was a railway inspector, I believe, and both his parents really wanted him to go to military school, which he was basically forced into. After only a very brief, miserable time in military school, he finally got out and studied first at the University of Prague and really, really got into what he wanted, which was art and literature and philosophy and history. He published one of his first collections called Lives and Songs in 1894, and even before turning 20, he had written a lot of poetry, mostly in the style of old German folk traditions. In 1899, he took a very, very life-changing trip to Russia where he met people like Leo Tolstoy. He also met the father of Boris Pasternak, the Russian writer, and many others, and Russia really, really like changed him, influenced him, and he had a 
basically a lifelong fascination with Russia. In 1902, another life-changing moment happened when he was commissioned to write a monograph upon Auguste Rodin, the French sculptor, and eventually went to live and stay with him in Paris, where Rodin eventually became his mentor. He taught him so many things. He wrote a very large, famous body of his work at that point. He also married and had a daughter named Ruth during this period. In 1914, at the beginning of the First World War, he found himself in Germany, and being part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, he was not allowed entry back into Paris and lost basically all of his belongings and his home there because for a time he had been living in Paris. A year later, he met Sigmund Freud, and shortly after that, he was drafted into the Austro-Hungarian Army and spent time working in the war archive in Vienna. At the close of the First World War, when the Austro-Hungarian Empire was eventually dissolved, Solved, he automatically became a Czech citizen in 1918. The war had left him very poor, wandering amiss, and he eventually settled in Switzerland in 1921 with the help of some friends. Rilke had struggled with very poor health for basically all of his life, but it finally came to a head in 1926 when he was diagnosed with leukemia and died that year, December 29th, age 51, in Switzerland. So that is a little bit on Rilke. Like I said, there is so much to his such a fascinating life so i would strongly encourage you to go out and read like literally anywhere um biographies on him or events that happened in his life or just his travels he spent a lot a lot of time traveling all over europe mostly if you have been introduced to rilke i would honestly love to know where please feel free to leave a comment telling me where you read your first bit of rilke or who told you about him maybe you discovered him through popular media because recently he's had quite a surge of popularity in some films, some TV shows, some books have mentioned him. So definitely please tell me because I'm always so interested which way and where he crops up. But how did I discover Rilke? It was at the age of 12 and it was through young adult supernatural romance about werewolves. However, while I was reading it, I remember coming across this passage and at the time I had absolutely no idea what it was, but I read it and I just stopped and my 12 year old brain didn't really know what to make of it, but I felt like I was being told something very beautiful and very important. Because a character in here named Sam, who is one of our protagonists, leaves Grace, the other protagonist, a note in her locker at high school. And it is one of Rilke's poems. It's the one that goes again and again, however we know the language of love and the little churchyard there with its saddening names and the frighteningly silent abyss into which the others fall. Again and again, the two of us go out under the ancient trees, make our bed again and again between the flowers, face to face with the sky. I read that and I don't, I don't know why it affected me so much, but from that point on, I started to look up and search on the internet and I would go through these weird poetry websites reading just random bits and fragments of Rilke's poetry. It wasn't really until a couple years after I read this in high school when I finally decided that I wanted a copy of a specific work that I had read so much of online and just wanted myself. And that book was Letters to a Young Poet. This is probably, I think, in the English language, Rilke's most famous piece. It is a collection of letters he wrote to a boy who was going to the same military academy which Rilke dropped out of, and this book, like, changed my life. It saved my life, and I don't honestly know what, um, my life would look like or what kind of person I would be without this and without Rilke's words. I got this book for Christmas when I was 15 and I didn't read it all until the spring of that year. The person I was before reading this book and the person I was after reading this book are two drastically different people. It was insane. I've never had an experience like that and I've heard so much of the same beautiful things from people who have read this book. From that point on, I slowly began to hoard and acquire my Rilke collection. I have most of his main body of works right now. I still have a few random bits and pieces of his, mostly his huge, vast collection of letters because Rilke wrote 15,000 letters, over 15,000 letters in the course of his life to friends, family, strangers, and there's a few little very, very early and later works of his that I haven't been able to find translated into English. But other than that, the ones I'm going to be talking about now are mostly his main body of works. I should also note that I have not yet read all of them. I've read most of my collection and I 
do think I have a pretty good idea of what to recommend just based on everything I've read and what I've heard about what I haven't read because I did do a bit of research. So without further ado, let's begin. So what did Rilke write about and how does this affect the way in which I would recommend where to start with him? There's also the very important question of how did he write because for translators of Rilke it is a very interesting task trying to translate his German into other languages. In the preface to Stories of God which is translated by M.D. Herder Norton, he says that translating Rilke means translating not only German but Rilke's very individual German. He sometimes uses odd words, more often he uses words oddly, sometimes he invents words, a process which goes better in German than in English. Nine times out of ten, one discovers an acuteness of observation and intent in his peculiar employment of a tense, an adjective, an adverb, a preposition. So Rilke is also quite famous for his oddity in German. I've heard a lot of people who are fluent in German and that's their mother language that when they read Rilke it's a very very strange interactive quirky experience. To talk about his language and his poetic vision in one line there was this really beautiful quote I think from the Poetry Foundation is where I found this, but they say that Rilke was unique in his efforts to expand the realm of poetry through new uses of syntax and imagery and in an aesthetic philosophy that rejected Christian precepts and strove to reconcile beauty and suffering, life and death. That is something I absolutely, absolutely love about him and that is so central. If there is a coin with two sides of it, then Rilke's work is completely melting down the coin into a bigger coin and saying that there aren't two sides and if there are two sides, then the two sides really just make one side of life and death, beauty and suffering, which is so beautiful and why so much of his work provides so much comfort and joy and this intense desire to live life, which has been so helpful to me through the years. All right, so where would I recommend you start if you have never read Rilke? I think the best way to get an immediate picture of who he is and what kind of philosophy and language and ideas you're dealing with is absolutely to start with his letters. Rilke is also very unique in that he put so much of his creative genius and his philosophy and his main huge ideas that tackle the subjects that he is so fond of and so enamored with writing about into his letters and then he would send them off wherever they may fall to his friends his family to strangers and so much of who he is and his creative body of work would just sit with these people scattered like little pieces all over the world which is not only a beautiful concept but i think it's quite rare to find among lots of poets and lots of people and authors we consider brilliant and people who have created classics that will last forever. We don't really find enduring bodies of really prominent ideas that they wrestle with in their letters that they expect to be compiled as part of their creative outlet. In the introduction to The Dark Interval, which is actually the selection that I'm currently reading, it says that at the time of his death in 1926, Rilke had written more than 14,000 letters, which the poet considered to be as significant as his poetry and prose. And I just, I absolutely love that because so much of Rilke is just this giving away of the self and in his letters that literally is what's happening. I would recommend starting with his letters and this preface agrees with me as well because he says especially for readers less familiar or comfortable with poetry which does comprise a very big big body of Rilke's work, his letters offer original yet accessible thoughts on the role of love, death, and art in our lives. More specifically where would I recommend you start with his letters? Whenever someone asks me I immediately will recommend letters to a young poet. This is the first completed volume I guess of a published work that I had read of his and it was the best place to start in my personal opinion. Like I said, these letters were written to a young man studying at the military academy who was writing to Rilke and asking him about how he should go about publishing and getting attention for his own poetry that this young man was writing. Rilke, also very famous for answering his fan mail and answering people, random people who would just send him letters, replied during an 18 month period from 1903 to 1904. Even though Rilke was only in his mid 20s when he was writing these, it was during the period where he was with Rodin in Paris and he was getting all of this new, fresh inspiration and idea on life life, death, on the role of art, which is also what these letters focus on so much, and how to go about showcasing art, and really they focus on the 
the solitude of the individual and how important it is to go within yourself to find things rather than outside of yourself. I think as well this is a great introduction to a lot of later, sometimes heavier and bigger and universal ideas because Letters to a Young Poet does start a bit smaller with the simple act of writing and how to go about being an artist but it does and it will include fragments and snapshots of bigger things like death and life and divinity which his later works really really grab onto and wrestle with and try to get to the bottom of and it is a very sometimes abstract and complicated experience but I think this is a perfect way to splash your feet in? No, what is the word? What is that? What is that sentence? Dip your toes in. Uh, for example, this passage, which I beg you as well as I can to have patience with everything that is unsolved in your heart and to try to cherish the questions themselves, like closed rooms and like books written in a very strange tongue. Do not search now for the answers which cannot be given you because you could not live them. It is a matter of living everything. Live the questions now. Perhaps you will then gradually, without noticing it, one distant day, live right into the answer. It's just stuff like that that this little book of letters is filled up, and it is an absolutely beautiful, beautiful experience. It will make you want to read more of him, and I think that is the biggest reward. And this is why Letters to a Young Poet is such a great place to start and why I would recommend out of all his many, many letters to start here. If you've read Letters to a Young Poet and are looking to move on with him, so much of his work and a lot of volumes of his poetry focus on the idea of God, his search for God and God's search for him. It's super important to note that when Rilke mentions the word God or any divinity or deity, he's not talking about God in the Christian tradition, in the Catholic tradition, in any human-made religion tradition. This is a quote that I really love, but it says that he's using the term to refer to the life force or nature or an all-embodying pantheistic consciousness that is only slowly coming to realize its existence. I absolutely love this idea, this kernel and nugget of God that develops through his entire body of work because it is one that is so fresh and magnificent and new and it's not something steeped in any tradition or ritual it's something that Rilke is coming to discover for himself and to write about it's just a really nice experience seeing that develop so I think personally for me because I didn't read this work which is what I'm going to recommend next which is stories of God I didn't read this until this year um, in the spring of this year and I wish I would have read it earlier before tackling some of his bigger volumes of poetry like the book of hours or like sonnets to Orpheus which features so much of his final and his later stage idea of this god. I wish I would have started with stories of god. This was written in 1899 during that huge inspirational trip to Russia. These are 13 stories about god and to him they are all infused with the task of transferring god from the realm of rumor to the experience of everyday lived life. They are also meant to be written to children and they kind of serve as Rilke speaking to children since he would always talk about how embarrassed he would get by trying to talk to people who were much younger than him and to kids and so they're very much written with this kind of simplistic almost fairy tale-esque language but they're also quite magical it's also so nice to kind of get and to see his early prose because Rilke only has one work that could even be considered a novel. So most of his work does occur in pieces of poetry, but to see him write in these 13 short stories is really, really nice. There's so much nice description and you really, really get that oddity of the German language he's using in here as well, because even the way that it's translated into English, it's like such a new experience of living and of using language in this way, which is so nice to see. It's also nice because like I said, you do get that half and half, but later as you go into more of his work, and you see him experience and grapple with these ideas of what he considers to be God, it's really, really nice to have this as a little bit of a foundation at least because you do get the sense that there's still kind of half of this tradition of God lingering, but then also in some of these stories, 
the idea of God just being everything and of everything being God, you really, really get that. And it is so beautiful in those few stories where that peeks through because eventually that will grow and really, really come out in his later works. So I'd really recommend this as well because it is just also such a lighthearted, wonderful, beautiful experience. So that is that one. From there, I'm just going to talk a little bit about kind of his poetry in general before moving into four works near the end, which I think are most beneficial, at least for me they would be if they were read in this order. So to talk about a huge body of his poetry, very briefly, we have the Book of Images and we also have New Poems, part one and two, because part one and part two were published a little bit separately. So this was written over 1899 to 1906, and this does cover a huge transitional period in his life with Russia, with Paris, um, and with a number of complicated relationships in his life. However, these are intensely, intensely lyrical, beautiful poems. And honestly, I think both the Book of Images and New Poems, you could probably throw in and read at any point in your Rilke experience, um, because I do think they mesh quite well with after having read Letters to Young Poets and Stories on God and a lot of his later works. Personally, I have not yet completed either of these works, which is really exciting, so I still have a number of poems left to read, but from what I have read, I really think that reading these poems could definitely add and benefit to whatever Rilke book you're reading at the moment, or at whatever point you're reading it at. The Book of Images Rilke describes as being poems about things and the thingness of things. These poems generally do follow impressions that things had given Rilke, whether they are material or immaterial, and in the preface it describes it that often one has the sense of Rilke writing his way into or through a poem, finding a feeling, an image, a situation, and following it wherever it leads him. I think this publication is always something you can come back to no matter what point you're at, and I think same could be said about New Poems, which was published after the Book of Images and after the Book of Hours, which I'm going to talk about in a second, but this is really, really praised for Rilke's kind of new relationship with language, and a lot of critics say that it's much, much better use of poetry. Now is also a really good time to mention Rilke's most famous translator, which is hands down Edward Snow. A lot of my favorite of Rilke's works are actually translated by different people, but that's not because I don't like Edward Snow's translations as well, moving away from those for a second. I think at any point it is also a great experience to read selected poetry. I have two volumes here. The first one is translated by Stephen Mitchell, and once again this is the beautiful Edward Snow translation. However, what is different about these is that they contain works and selections from a variety and a number of what I'm going to talk about in a second that I think is really beneficial not to read in the order in which they appear here because there's so much about certain ideas and certain following through and threads that is really really nice when you experience it in this one order in which um, he wrote them so that's what we're going to talk about now but like I said I think it is just always a beautiful experience to read his poetry no matter where you're at with him. So next up I'm going to recommend the volume of his poetry that is my personal favorite of what I read so far at the moment because it changes all the time but this book really really affected me so much. All of his work does but this one in particular just really really was so beautiful and made me just really want to get at language so much more and to find out what was really kind of on the other side of it. So this is what Rilke and a lot of people consider to be his true commencement of his legacy to poetry and his own poetic legacy of his lifetime, which is the Book of Hours. This is what's regarded as kind of his first real addition to the work of poetry in the world. So this is also known as Love Poems to God and it's split into three parts, the book of a monastic life, the book of pilgrimage, and the book of poverty and death. The book of ours has been described as a series of prayers written as if by a Russian monk turned iconographer. So in the book of ours you like really really see Rilke's grasp with God and this hunting down of God but also this dual and double-sided relationship where God is hunting down humans and trying to be close to them too. He might be the first poet who asks God what will God do when I die. It's also a collection where Rilke kind of grapples with the idea of separation, the idea of transience, the idea of death and what happens when one we love passes away, which is why I would, I hadn't really thought of this until now because I'm reading The Dark Interval right now, but it is a 
collection that is so beautifully in line with the dark interval and i think to read both of these either one after the other or together would be such a beautiful experience because the dark interval these are letters that rilke has written to people who are grieving who have lost someone they loved who are experiencing death or pain or illness and in this he provides so much again of his philosophy that does start to kind of grow out of the book of hours on death and transience and separation which is that there's no such thing in it there's also this beautiful idea that we've created god and that god has created us as well there's this whole like nothing can exist without my beholding it as well as this one line that is just so wonderful that i am the world he stumbled out of so it's kind of this like dual act of creation and there's this back and forth and it's just this ever evolving ever changing relationship with all of the world and of nature and this being that is god and maybe god is just being. And to just read it with all the knowledge that he puts into these letters in the dark interval about death, how death is not something to be mourned at all, because those that we love and those with whom we've created a bond, nothing can ever sever it. It starts to begin a little bit in this because he's saying no looking beyond, no belittling of death but only longing for what belongs to us and serving earth lest we remain unused. It's just so beautiful to like see how so much of his work works together. And like, I think he, he knows that and that's why he puts so much into his letters as well. There eventually starts to be so much of this turning around of attitudes towards death and suffering because he just thinks that all of life is experience and that you have to live through everything, the good and the bad. And I think after reading the book of hours once you get through it and once maybe you've gotten through the dark interval there's a really really nice other segue because he begins to talk in this one letter to a friend that it is a blessed moment of inner life when one decides or resolves from now on to love with all one's strength and unflinchingly that which one fears the most that which has made us, according to our own measure, suffer too much. Combine that with the idea he writes in another letter, which is to have faith in what is most horrible. I think that leads really nicely into his biggest work of prose and what could be considered his only and first novel, which is The Notebooks of Malta Lorid Briga. Am I saying that right? In this letter, he also even mentions this book, which he's looking back retrospectively at writing. And he says that the perfect image of this unity of good and evil, light and darkness, beauty and suffering, this identity of absence and presence that perhaps forms the fundamental equation of our life. The writings of Malta represent only a first step or two in that direction. So The Book of Hours was written in 1905, and then after that came New Poems, part one and two, which finished in 1908, and The Notebooks comes in 1910. This is a loosely autobiographical novel following a young, poor student who is struggling to study and live in Paris, his musings on life, his suffering, and he also believes that he is the last descendant of this Danish nobility. Back describes it as a meditation on being young and alone in Paris, and of course a lot of that comes from Rilke's own experience living in Paris and living with Rodin. Most critics call The Notebooks the crisis of his career because he spent so much time in evolving and exploring these ideas of God and art, and art as the kind of supreme savior of humanity in and of itself, the apotheosis of art, but by the time he gets to and writes The Notebooks, things aren't going so well and he realizes that maybe all these ideas are for naught. He writes in a letter that the significant question that is asked in the notebooks is how is it possible to live when after all the elements of this life are utterly incomprehensible to us? He actually didn't even finish this book and it ends so ambiguously because he wrote to a friend in a letter that he was too exhausted to go on and so he just ended it where it was. I don't recommend reading the notebooks at all as a first step or even after reading a little bit of his poetry. It's the most disheartening of all of Rilke's work. It's one that offers not very much hope or salvation. A lot of this book is so tragic, so sad, so filled with anxiety and fear. It was a book that when I read it, it made me feel so much anxiety. Malta, our main character who we're following, constantly questions life and death. And you get this huge overwhelming fear of his about living and this kind of crisis that he's in. He's almost paralyzed. He can't go on. He can't do very much. He sees 
nothing in these people that he passes. For example, this passage is absolutely depressing and heartbreaking. It says, is it possible that we have neither seen nor perceived nor said anything real or of any importance yet? Is it possible that we have had thousands of years to look, ponder and record and that we have let those thousands of years pass like a break at school when one eats a sandwich and an apple? Yes, it is possible. Is it possible that despite our inventions and progress, despite our culture, religion, and knowledge of the world, we have remained on the surface of life? Is it possible that even that surface, which might still have been something, has been covered with an unbelievably boring material, leaving it looking like drawing room furniture in the summer holidays? Yes, it is possible. It is a beautifully haunting read, this novel. I think it's the least Rilke, Rilke work, if that makes sense, but as well, some critics have said that this book was so necessary for him because it proved to be a sort of catharsis that led him to create what everyone thinks is his most magnificent piece ever and what so many people have compared to The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot and that influential of a piece of poetry. Um, which he wrote after this. This book does demonstrate though just how beautiful his writing is, how he can like really really create these beautiful poems but then also sit down and write this heartbreaking soul-ripping sort of book but that they are both equally beautiful products. It is quite a jarring experience and not one that is very fun or filled with hope and like he said in his letter only tiptoes towards the idea of embracing everything and learning to live with both sides of life and death so that is the notebooks and finally the last work which i have to recommend which i just talked about i wish i had read this last and i know by the time i finally get back around to reading it for the second time it will be something completely new to me because Everything kind of stacks. All of Rilke's work stack on top of each other to influence and trickle down. And it's like kind of paint, different shades and colors of paint blurring into one another to create this, which is the Duino Elegies and the Sonnets to Orpheus. Now these are two different works, but they are always, always published together because they balance each other so perfectly. They're like dark and light, shadow and sunlight and they're always put basically side by side. These were both published in 1923, just three years before he died, but the Duino elegies have actually been a 10-year process to complete. They're called the Duino elegies because he first began forming this idea and receiving these elegies, which he kind of describes as being laid upon him like a prayer from elsewhere at the Duino castle in Italy. So finally, in this culmination of the Duino elegies and the sonnets to Orpheus, you get this huge buildup finally coming to its conclusion. Rilke is finally done wrestling with these concepts and lays them here for better or worse in darkness and shadow. The Duino elegy screams, how do I live? What does it mean to live? In what way should I live? And to finish off with the sonnets to Orpheus, which is this resounding language of joy at life no matter what it brings is so beautiful it's not something i have fully appreciated enough as i would like because i read so much more of his work now that is such a wonderful staircase leading up to this beautiful beautiful work this is the one that famously begins with the first elegy beauty's nothing but the starts of terror we can hardly bear and we adore it because of the serene scorn it could kill us with every angel's terrifying. It goes on and really frantically seems to ask questions like, shouldn't our ancient suffering be more fruitful by now? But Sonnets to Orpheus, just to end up this video, is filled with really amazing things that mean so much more after you've read the beginning of Rilke, I suppose. Spring has returned again. The earth is like a child who's memorized poems many so many it was worth the long painful lesson but for us existence is still enchanted it's still beginning in a hundred places and finally it ends and if the earthly has forgotten you say to the still earth i flow to the rushing water speak i am so those are my recommendations on where to start with rilke i've not really found anyone who's read him so it's always so exciting to me when I get to speak with other people who know him or who are so excited and passionate about him because 
His writing will just always be to me, I think, the most beautiful thing I've ever found on earth. And I'm just always so ready to talk more about Rilke. So I really hope this video was helpful or made you want to read more of Rilke because it is honestly one of the most life-changing experiences and I will never be able to put into words how grateful and thankful I am that he chose to share his vision and his words and his poetry with the world. So yeah, thank you so so much for watching. I loved making this video. If you would like to see more of these kinds of videos, maybe with where to start with different authors or videos about specific books or specific works, um, please let me know. I hope you're having a really good day wherever you are and I will see you very soon in my next video. I'm gonna go read some Rilke right now. <laughs> Ciao! Thank you.